So, all right. So welcome to the small ruminant conference. One of the things that we like to do on the first day is talk about the Central Florida Livestock Agents Group, what we do, what kind of resources we can provide you, and also um, do a little promotion for the extension offices uh, that are located throughout the county, just in case you're not familiar um, with them. It's really important as livestock producers to know all of your resources that are available to you. Um, it's a good networking opportunity. You always have to, to continue to learn and um, in order to make sure that your, your production is uh, staying relevant. So the first slide I'm gonna go over is UF IFAS extension. So we are located in all 67 counties. Hopefully you are familiar with your uh, local county office. If not, I encourage you to reach out to um, your county livestock agent. Sometimes they're referred to as an agriculture agent, a small farms agent, uh, ag and natural resources agent, um, or just livestock. So when you call your local extension office, let them know what your production is, small ruminants, and they will um, connect you with the, the right agent um, to help you answer your questions. You can contact them today and not even have a question. Just contact them, research, uh, reach out to them and let them know, hey, I live in this area. This is what my um, herd looks like, the number size. Um, these are kind of my production goals. So then they're just familiar with, with you. And then when you do have a question or an issue, you can reach out to them. They'll be familiar with you already. And um, even if they have programs such as this, they can email you directly and let you know, hey, you told me that you were a, um, you raise lambs and we're having this program at our office and we'd like to invite you. Um, sometimes there's research done at the, at the University of Florida and they like us as agents to reach out to local producers and include them in that research or evaluation. And so having that contact with the local producers um, is important. So through UF IFAS Extension, we provide and find solutions that you need. Um, we may not have all of the answers, but we can find the answers for you. Um, we offer unbiased, research-based, and current information. And that current information is really important. Hence, one of the reasons why um, at the end of this session, you'll participate in evaluation. Um, some of those evaluation questions will ask, um, what production practices are you doing before and after this presentation? Um, what are some topics you would like for us to have at our next program? All of that is really important. So therefore we can continue to stay current on, um, on providing information for you. One of the things too is we offer programming in a number of ways. So one of that is just one-on-one -on -one cons consultations. If you have a question, uh, an issue that you're having, you can call your local extension agent, you can email them, they can come out and do field visits, you can come to their office and do visits. Um, we also offer group training, certification programs, uh, field demonstrations, webinars such as this, a number of publications, and uh, social media. So with CFLAG, um, this is really a partnership. There are a number of counties who are involved in the Central Florida region who partner to create CFLAG. And uh, we're composed of county extension agents, research faculty, extension specialists, and then from time to time we'll include other agencies um, in order to stay relevant on current information. So one of the agencies that we recently had on our meetings is FDAX. So we could um, communicate with them on, on some changes that are, are happening in their organization. 
So really that partnership is key in order to make CFLAGS successful and to make sure that we are um, providing all the information needed to local producers. So the goal is to coordinate um, with extension and research activities. And there's some pictures on the, um, on the slide of various programs that have been done. And we want to provide, and we do provide farmers, ranchers, and producers with research-based knowledge that they need. Um, we like to say that we're the jack of all trades, but master of none, but together through that partnership, we become a master and we become, um, we're able to provide all of the information that you are needing. On the slide are uh, just some of the events that we have throughout the year. Um, some of these are done individually by um, an agent and some of them are partners with all of the agents that are part of CFLAG. So we have a beef management course. Um, there's a spring ranchers forum. <laughs> we have a Florida horse owners educational workshop beef cattle reproductive management school, which that's coming up in August, our equine institute, the small ruminant conference. And then um, we had a, a couple during COVID when a lot of us were closed. Um, we had Ask the Expert, which was on our social media pages. And that was just a way to connect with our um, producers and our specialists. So there's a number of ways that you can uh, reach CFLAG and stay current with information and programs that we have. Um, one, like discussed, finding your local office. I will put all of these links in the chat box so they are available to you. We have our YouTube channel where we post um, the recorded webinars online so you have access to them. Or if we create any videos, we also post those on our YouTube page. We have our Facebook page that lists a lot of uh, events, upcoming events, um, tidbits of information. Uh, agents, if they're out in the field, they'll take pictures and include them on there. And then we have uh, our website that has uh, different reports, publications, videos. Uh, we have a newsletter that you can have access to um, that gives uh, information about different ag and parts of the ag sector, um, forages, beef cattle, horses, um, upcoming information, changes in the ag industry, um, weeds. So it's a, a really good newsletter that all of the CFLAG agents have a, a part in creating. So that is um, C flag in a nutshell, an extension. So your um, homework assignment, let's say, is to reach out to your local extension office if you have not done so already and, um, and introduce yourself uh, to your livestock agent and um, start to build that, that partnership. And like I said, I will put all of these links in the chat box so you have them. Go ahead and do that now. I'm having issues with this poll thing. <laughs> no, it's not saving. It's not saving? No. Um, I don't think, I think you'll have to make me a host in order for me to go in and there we go. You're a host now. Thanks for your patience. We're dealing with technicalities here. Okay. Next on the, is there any questions, uh, from our audience? You can unmute yourself and ask the questions, Caitlin, if, if there's there's any. We wanted to get you 
familiarized with what we have to offer. Uh, I know that some of us are kind of hidden because of everything else that happens in our lives. And, uh, um, you know, we want to we wanna be that bridge that, that you have with science-based information. That's why we wanted to highlight what we do and who we are. Next, so I put all the links on in the chat box. So the YouTube ones first, then Facebook, and then the link to find your local extension office. And then um, the last one is our CFLAG website. Super, thank you. All right, so I would like to say that I really appreciate this. That's all. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that. It's important. Yeah, but, okay. Yeah. All right, next on the program, we got Brittany Justison. We got two Britneys today, so it's kind of confusing, but this is Brittany number one uh, from Osceola County. And uh, she's gonna be talking about biosecurity for us. Uh, so go ahead and take it away. All right, well, thank you for having me today. I'm gonna uh, go ahead and share my screen. Sorry about this. All right, can everybody see that well? Good, great. All right, so as you mentioned, my name is Brittany Justison and I'm the Livestock and Forages Extension Agent in Osceola County. I'm excited to be here today and I'm going to be talking with you guys about biosecurity. So today, just a little run through, I'm gonna um, talk about what biosecurity is and then I'm gonna talk about why it's important for your operation as well as what causes diseases and then how are those diseases spread? And then some biosecurity practices that you can do on your operation to help minimize that risk from bringing disease onto your operation as well as if you do um, to keep it from spreading. So, all right. So what is biosecurity? And biosecurity are management practices that you can do as a producer to help prevent the introduction and spread of disease on your operation. So some of you might be wondering, well, why is that important? Well, biosecurity is important for a, num a number of reasons. Biosecurity is important to make sure your, your animals are healthy, to make sure you are, um, they're not suffering, um, to make sure they're healthy and there's, you know, that's a part of animal welfare. Um, and when those animals are healthier, you do have better production on your operation as well as you do have higher profits in the long run. And one of the main things, um, not only to help make sure your animals are healthy, but to also make sure that you're healthy. So there's no, uh, it helps reduce the risk of disease to you. Because some of these diseases are what's known as zoonotic, meaning they could be transmitted um, from people to animals and animals to people. So we don't want you to get any of these diseases as well. So the first step is to create a biosecurity plan. And you should develop a biosecurity plan with all parties that are involved in your operation. And this is essentially a self-assessment of, of your operation and what you could do to prevent the risk and, of bringing disease on your operation, as well as how to um, prevent it from spreading and um, how to treat sick animals on your operation. So you should be working with, um, if family members help you on your operation, you should definitely include them in the biosecurity plan as well as, as veterinarians, they could be a huge asset to you. Um, when developing a biosecurity plan, your local extension agent can really be a, a strong asset to you as well. And any employees or people that are working on volunteers or anyone like that working on your, your farm um, to help to make sure they you guys cover all the bases, as well as to make sure they fully understand what your biosecurity plan means. Um, and then you should write it down because that's important. So that way you don't forget it and then make sure everyone understands it. And then you should review it every year to make sure you don't need to make any changes or if, if so, to update it every year. And then um, follow it through. If you write it down, um, that's great. But if you're not following it through, then you're really, you're really not um, enforcing the biosecurity plan and it's not going to work. So next we're gonna talk about what causes infectious diseases. And these are just some examples. They're not all of the diseases that um, sheep and goats can get. These are just some of them. And it, um, we're gonna go over some examples and, and, and what diseases, uh, diseases sheep and goats can get. So bacteria can cause CL, 
which is uh, caseous lymphoditis, um, and that causes uh, abscesses in the lymph node areas, such as under the jaw and um, around the shoulder, and it can also cause um, internal abscess, which is more common in sheep. Um, brucellosis is another example of a bacterial, um, is spread by the bacteria. And this can affect uh, cattle, sheep, goats, dogs, uh, horses, pigs, deer. Um, and brucellosis and CL are both zoonotic, so meaning you can get that. Um, CL is spread by coming in direct contact with the pus. And brucellosis um, can be spread if you have a cut on your hand and you come in, in contact with your cut with blood or any type of um, aborted fetus or, or uh, afterbirth or something like that. Or if you're drinking um, raw and unpasteurized milk, that could be a, a risk factor for, for people to get brucellosis. Another bacterial uh, bacteria example would be enterotoxemia, which is also known as overeating disease. And this is a clostridial, um, clostridium bacteria, uh, so it would be Clostridium perforandus C and D. Um, and this is, you can find this in the animal's gut. And then Clostridial uh, tetani is found in the soil. And that's why you uh, would vaccinate for CD, a CBT vaccine. And then some viruses are, would be examples are uh, CAEs as caprine arthri arthritic encephalitis. And this can cause, um, like, a, it's a lifelong infection, and it can, can be spread from the mother to the offspring in the milk. And it, in the adults, it can cause arthritis. And in the young uh, lambs and kids, it can cause encephalitis. So the next one is sore mouth, and this is zoonotic as well. And it can cause, um, it's essentially from the, para, it's a parapox virus, and it's similar to the chickenpox virus in kids. And this lives in the ground. And it can cause sores around the mouth, on the teats and ears and stuff like that. And we're gonna um, actually see a picture of this later on in the slides. Another example would be a fu a, like a fungi, which is a ringworm. And another one would be pr a prion, which is a misshaped protein. And this can cause scraping. And then a protozoan parasite, an example of that would be coccidiosis. So um, some of the ways diseases, um, those were just some of the examples, can be spread is through direct and indirect contact. So an example of direct contact would be if I, if someone was sick with a cold and they sneezed on you, that would be direct contact. But if the person that had the cold sneezed in their hand and then touched the door handle, and then you came behind and touched the door handle, you could get the, you know, you could get sick from touching that door handle and wiping your face or, or eating with your hands. Um, so the same with, with animals. Animals can get sick um, and can spread disease through indirect and direct contact. And some examples of indirect transmission would be contaminated feeders, um, waters. Your shoes can carry a lot of diseases and you might not think about it. Um, clothing, as well as equipment, uh, trucks and trailers, anything like that. Direct transmission, some examples would be your saliva nasal discharge, feces or urine, blood, pus, milk, and respiratory air droplets. So now we're gonna go over, now that you know what causes diseases and how they're transmitted, um, now we're gonna go over some biosecurity practices that can help you as a producer try to minimize some of those risks. So one of the greatest risks to biosecurity is bringing new animals onto your operation. They, there's a saying, you don't want um, to bring home disease or you don't want it to walk right through your gate. And bringing new animals in, um, it, it, so you, it's easier to keep disease out than it is to try to eliminate once it's, once it's in your herd or flock. So it's important not to loan animals out to your neighbors or friends or borrow animals. Um, you know, some people may borrow a buck or a ram for breeding and, um, or, you know, you don't want to lease animals and showing animals can also increase that risk. So to keep that, um, to keep and maintain that closed herd or flock, um, you can to do because you need to introduce new genetics to your operation. So some of the options you should, you could have is utilizing AI, which um, has some limitations. It could be, you know, challenging if someone doesn't know how to do it, you might have to hire someone to come in as well as um, you can raise your own replacements um, if you need additional um, animals in your herd or flock. 
With that being said, it is challenging to maintain that closed flock. If you maintain a mostly closed herder flock is the best option as well. So um, to bring in those new genetics, purchasing a ram or buck every couple years um, can be helpful. That way you're not bringing in new animals all the time. And since I am a 4-H agent, um, I love to see people show. I think it's great. It's great for people to learn and it's a great experience. So if you do plan to show, there are some precautions you can take um, to help decrease some of those risks. Um, if you do take your animal to a show, make sure you're decreasing the contact between other animals. You could put cardboard up or something so there no, there's no nose to nose contact in between the pens or by the pens next to you so you have a space in between. Avoid sharing any type of equipment with any of your friends or neighbors. And if, if you must share, um, make sure you are cleaning and disinfecting before and after sharing those, those equipment. Um, also, make sure you're disinfecting everything when you get home. Um, make sure you're disinfecting your truck and trailer, any type of anything that was brought to the show, disinfect it. And then washing your hands um, and throughout the show can also help. So if you're, you know, helping your, your friend or neighbor with a, your, their show animal and then you come back to yours, you know, try to at least use some hand sanitizer or something in between your animals. Um, Obviously don't share food or water with other animals. And then, like I said, disinfect and ice or quarantine that animal when you do bring them home for at least 30 days. And we're gonna talk about that a little more. So as we talked about, if you need to purchase a new ram or buck um, to increase your genetics, or if you do need to purchase some new animals, make sure you're purchasing healthy animals. Purchasing healthy animals from a reputable breeder is really important. Um, if they have a good reputation, you know, that they're you know, a great breeder, they're following biosecurity uh, practices, um, they do a great job. Those are, those are the people you wanna look at. Um, it's really not recommended to purchase any type of animal from a livestock auction. When um, animals are sent to the livestock auctions, usually for a reason, whether it's poor genetics or they have a problem and they're cold for a certain reason, um, you don't really have a history on that animal as well as when they are in that livestock barn, they're um, exposed to a lot of animals and a lot of diseases. And that's a huge risk when you're bringing that onto your operation. You might think you've got a heck of a deal on a buck or a ram and you're bringing it home and you're going to breed it to your does and use and, you know, you, you think you got a really good deal. And then they, you bring home disease and you spread it to your herd. And you might think you got a good deal, but now you're costing yourself a lot of money in the long run. So um, it's usually not recommended to go to a livestock auction to purchase um, new animals. Also, avoid bringing new animals um, into your operation when your flock and herds is most susceptible. So if they're pregnant or lambing or kidding, that's usually not a good um, time to bring new animals in. If you do have to buy um, multiple animals, um, try to buy from the same breeder. That way um, you're minimizing some risk there as well. You don't want to buy five different animals from five different um, breeders because that could increase the risks. When you do go to purchase a individual animal, make sure you're not looking, you're not just looking at the individual animal, but you're also looking at the entire herd or flock as well. You wanna make sure that individual animal is healthy, but as well as the entire flock and herd. You know, make sure their behavior looks normal, make sure they're not limping, look at their hooves, make sure their coat and fleece looks great. Um, there's no signs of, you know, sickness. They don't have discharge from the eyes or nose or anything like that. So look at those animals in a whole. And then ask questions. It's really important to ask those questions to the that producer. Um, what have they or do they vaccinate their their herd or flock? Um, what do they use? How often do they vaccinate? Are they deworming those animals? Um, how often are they deworming them? And what brand are they using? Because if they're using the same type of dewormer brand all the time, that could be a, a cause for concern when it comes to resistance for worms. Um, as well as look at what they're feeding the animals, minerals, anything like that, any type of nutrition that they're giving those animals. Um, and then ask them what their biosecurity plan is. And if that breeder doesn't have one, and I said, well, what's a biosecurity plan? You know, that might not be the best option for you to bring home an animal if you're trying to minimize risk of disease on your operation. And then you, if you ask that breeder, well, have you had any problems with diseases on the operation? And they say, no, you know, everybody's on the operation is great. But if they've never tested, they might not know. So it's important to test those animals um, or, or ask them if they have tested in the past to make sure 
um, you know, that could be another option for you to help uh, prevent disease from coming on your operation. Because some animals can just be symptom free and be carriers rather than show symptoms of diseases. The next biosecurity practice is quarantining new animals. So if you do purchase a new animal, um, when you are bringing them home, whether it's the new animal that you purchase or if it's a show animal, make sure you are quarantining them for four weeks. Some animals can be carriers for diseases for two to three weeks. Um, if they are sick, that could you know, arise within two to three weeks. So it's really important to at least minimize or to at least quarantine them for at least four weeks. Um, when you do quarantine them, make sure you are quarantining them far enough away from your, your healthy flock and herd, at least 30 feet. You don't want to um, have them have any type of nose to nose contact. And make sure you watch those animals daily for symptoms. Um, look at their feet, make sure you, know, you can take their temperature, make sure their vitals look good, check their mucous membranes, and make sure they're pink and moist and healthy. The animal looks healthy overall. Um, and then feed and water for that animal should be done last. You don't want to you know, take care of them first and then take care of your healthy animals. That should be done last. The quarantine animals should be done last. And then um, you don't want, obviously, there to be a, a shared source of water or any type of food. And then after you do leave the quarantine area, make sure you disinfect properly. If you do need to go back into your healthy herd after leaving the quarantine area, make sure um, you change your clothes clothes and shoes and take all precautions. The next biosecurity plan is isolating sick animals. Um, you should monitor all your animals every day. It's really important to make sure they're all healthy every single day. And you need to know what is normal first to know what is abnormal in your herd. So look at their behavior. You know, usually if they're social animals and then all of a sudden they're isolating themselves by, you know, in the corner of the pasture, um, if they're not eating, usually, you know, they're eating normally and they're not eating all of a sudden. Look at their posture. Do they look hunched over? Are, are they ataxic where their back ends kind of wobbly, falling over? Are they high stepping, acting weird? Um, make sure they're not lame. Um, look at their activity level. Do they seem lethargic? Or are they playing and climbing and doing fun stuff? Look at their coat and fleece. Make sure they don't have ringworm. Um, Look at to make sure, look and check to make sure they have normal vital signs. Um, and if you do notice that an animal is sick, you should isolate them right away. You don't want to wait and see how, if they get better or worse, because um, then they could be spreading to the rest of your herd and flock. And when you do isolate them, um, you want to isolate them away from the herd and flock, just like the quarantine area. Um, you want to separate them from the quarantine area as well. You don't want them to be next to each other if you do have animals there. And then contact your veterinarian. I always say treat smart. You don't just want to go in your barn and see what you have and treat the animal and see if it gets better. Contact your, your veterinarian and use them as a resource to see, you know, they might not have to come out to your operation. They could just talk to you over the phone and, and give you a recommendation of what type of medication to give, depending on what, what the problem is. And here in the bottom left corner is a picture of an animal that has CL. And as we talked about, CL is caseus lymphatitis, and um, those are abscesses um, that are caused by a bacterial disease, and they are formed in the lymph node areas under the jaw and the shoulder area, as well as internally. Um, and this is spread by the pus, so people could get it if they come in contact with it, or other animals if that uh, abscess ru ruptures. Um, they can get it if the goat or, or something rubs, if the goat rubs up onto something, or if you have shearing equipment, and you know, you're sharing that steering equipment without disinfecting it um, in between animals as well. Um, so those are those are things the way that's how, sorry, that's how CL is spread, as well as once um, the animal does get CL, it, it can't be cured. So um, and it can live in the ground for a long time. Um, the other picture on the right hand side is a picture of sore mouth. And a sore mouth is a parapox virus as we talked about, it's similar to chicken pox in children. And it's pretty much scabs and sores around the mouth, um, the teeth, the ears. And um, this can live in the ground. And this, um, it doesn't, it's not fatal, but it can um, cause, you know, lambs and ki kids from not or being, becoming reluctant to nurse. And there is a live vaccine that can be given, but it must be given once um, the 
uh, sore mouth has already been ex spread in your herd or exposed in your herd because it is a live vaccine. So you're essentially giving your herd or flock um, sore mouth. So it just helps um, bring down the severity of, of the disease. So the next biosecurity practice um, is restricting access on your farm. So you wanna limit visitors and vehicle traffic on your operation. Um, you don't want people to bring stuff onto your operation. Um, it's great if you do agritourism, but there are steps that you can take to help minimize some of those risks. So provide visitors with boot covers or um, a, foot bath state, a foot, foot bath area where they could dip their um, boots in some um, disinfectant, but you can't disinfect organic matter. So it's important to make sure that um, they're, they're cleaning the crevices of the boot, making sure there's no um, feces or, or dirt or mud caked in there because they're just gonna be dunking that into the foot baths and then it won't be beneficial. Um, and then also make sure there's wash stations available or any type of hand sanitizer, um, as well as keep vehicles and trailers close to the entrance as possible and clean and disinfect them um, after use um, right, right away. As we talked about the organic matter, make sure you're getting all that manure off the trailer, the dirt um, before you're disinfecting. And keep the gate closed. This can keep unwanted visitors out. Some people are nosy and they like to come on your operation and see your goats and see what you have and see your sheep. And, and you know, keeping that gate closed can minimize um, people from doing that. And post signs to restrict access. Let people know that you do have a biosecurity plan in place. And if they do want to come on their op onto your operation, to contact you. And that way, you guys can set up a, a time so they can come see, see your operation and your your livestock. Um, and make sure your your your, fence, your perimeter fence is secure. You don't want um, neighbor neighboring uh, goats and sheep or other livestock wandering onto your operation because your fence is, is not secured. The next biosecurity practice is good sanitation. I can't stress this one enough. It's really important um, to clean and disinfect everything. Your waters, your feeders, your barn, your lambing and kidding areas, your shearing equipment, as we talked about before, uh, CL can be spread by shearing equipment, but so can sore mouth and so can ringworm. So make sure you are disinfecting. Um, if you do, um, you know, if you do shear, make sure you're going from your youngest, um, healthiest animals to your oldest animals and make sure you're disinfecting. Um, it, that could really go a long way. As and always provide a clean water to your animals. Uh, water is the most important essential nutrient for any animal. So it's important to make sure they always have um, adequate access to, to clean water. And use feeders instead of feeding on the ground. Feeding on the ground, um, they can pick up disease as well as parasites. And don't overstock and overgraze pastures. This can cause overstocking and pastures can cause additional manure buildup as well as parasites. And then, you know, you can get coccidiosis this way as well. Um, and keep feed clean and prevent cats and any type of wildlife from accessing the feed bins. Um, whether you keep it in a trash can or any sealed type bin, so you know you keep that that feed um, free of moisture as well as clean. Um, really making sure you're preventing cats from getting in there. I know a lot of people own cats to prevent rodents populations or to minimize rodent populations, and that's great. Um, you know some of those wildlife are vectors for diseases as well. But those cats um, pose a threat because they carry toxoplasmosis, um, which is a protozoan parasite. And that toxoplasmosis can cause abortions in sheep, goats, and actually can cause abortions in pregnant women as well. So really try to prevent those cats from getting into that feed room. And then keep good personal hygiene. As we talked about before, washing your hands using hand sanitizer and you know, don't walk out into your pens barefooted and you know, go to your neighbor's house, so, and vice versa. You really wanna just keep good hygiene and that, that can really go a long way. So the next biosecurity practice is practice preventative management. So work with your veterinarian to de develop a herd health program, whether it is um, vaccinations or um, nutrition or, or reproduction. Your veterinarian can be a, a huge tool for you to help you um, have a successful successful operation. And it's it's not a one size fits all. Just because your neighbor's doing it doesn't mean it's always the best option for you. Um, so you should always work with them to customize a herd health program for you. And then provide adequate nutrition for stage age and stage of production. Um, make sure you're providing adequate nutrition and minerals for uh, say a pregnant 
pregnant animal versus a lactating animal versus a growing animal versus a maintenance animal. Um, as well as look at the animal's body condition scores. This could be a good indicator if your animals are getting enough nutrition. Do this frequently. Body condition score is essentially the uh, is a looking at the adequate um, fat coverage over the animal. And for sheep and goats, it's a, on a, a scale of one to five, and you want to look at um, around a three is usually good. And then um, provide those animals with a stress-free environment. Stress can really cause havoc on, um, on the immune system. And I forgot to mention, nutrition is a huge foundation for, for uh, good. So that's important to always make sure you have good nutrition. But for stress-free environment, sorry, skipping back down. So stress-free environment, um, it's really important to make sure you're minimizing those stress, stress factors, such as um, predators. Predators could be a big one for sheep and goats. Um, whether it's coyotes or bobcats, but a lot of people don't think about dogs. Dogs can be a, a big predator against sheep and goats. And I've seen some pretty bad dog attacks on sheep and goats and it's not ever fun for the producer to, to have to deal with. As well as if you are transporting those animals that can be stressful for them, or if you're introducing new animals onto your operation. Um, new animals, especially social animals like goats, that could be a stressful time for them. So just try to minimize whatever stress um, that stress factors that you may have, making sure they have appropriate shelters or anything like that. And then identify animals properly, making sure they have, I have a picture here of a tattoo and then your tag. Um, identifying animals properly can help you uh, maintain and keep good records on those animals. So maintaining good record keeping is really important for your operation. You want to write down what type of surgical procedures you're doing if you're debutting or castrating. Um, and then you want to also write down you're giving vaccinations or medication, always follow the label. Um, and then what date you gave it, the route you gave it, if you gave it sub Q, which is under the skin, I am the muscle, IV, and the intranasal, anything like that. So you want to write all that down, your reproductive race. Record keeping can really help you determine if there is a health problem in your herd. And then the last biosecurity practice we're going to talk about today is disposal. Make sure you're disposing, disposing your manure um, properly. And then also, if you would like to spread that manure out back on the pasture, make sure you're composting it properly, which is important if you're doing it correctly um, to make sure the temperature can kill some of those, um, uh, kill the weed uh, seeds as well as any parasites or pathogens and, and it helps decrease your fly population. And then keep that manure um, and feed equipment separate. You don't want to be using the same type, same equipment you do to clean up manure that you would to feed your animals. And then dispose, remove, and burial of, of your livestock if, if one does pass away. This is can vary depending on your location. So work with your extension agent or veterinarian or, or someone in your area to help you determine what the best course of action is for that. And as well as make sure you're removing and disposing of that afterbirth. Um, that can also bring in predators and wildlife as well. And then necropsies are really important. You know, some people, if an animal dies, they say, oh, well, I just died. Well, why? You wanna make sure you find out why. Have, call your veterinarian, they can help you um, help perform a necropsy to determine what, what was the cause. And then if there is a problem, it can help save some of your other animals in, in your um, herd or flock. So in summary, Make sure you're working with all parties involved to develop a plan and write it down and then follow it through. Keep a closed herd or flock. If you can't do that, try to keep a mostly closed herd or flock. Um, quarantine new animals as well as show animals and isolate any sick animals that do um, become a problem on your operation, as well as limit any um, outside visitors. Keep good sanitation at all times and keep a good client and veterinarian relationship. They can really help you prevent any, any type of disease rather than just learning how to treat it. And use proper disposal of manure and any type of animal that does pass away. So does anyone have any questions? You're welcome to unmute or um, jump in the chat. Don't everyone run at once. <laughs> just want to say thank you, Miss Brittany. You are so welcome. I'm happy to help. Thank if you guys have any questions or think of any, please don't hesitate. I'm uh, actually writing down your email if you don't mind. Okay, great. And I'll, I'm going to share this PowerPoint um, 
So if you guys want to reach out to me later and I'll be on the rest of, of the day, if you guys think of some and I'll be on tomorrow as well. Um, and there are some a ton of great resources from other extension offices. You can't find any on UF. Um, University of Maryland has uh, some great resources on biosecurity for goat and sheep owners, as well as so does University of Maine. So there's a lot of other universities that you guys can find some additional resources and I, I'm happy to provide some, some as well as needed. Super, thank you. You're welcome. All right. Well, if no one has any questions, um, I'm happy to be here today and thank you for having me. And if you guys think of anything, please don't hesitate, like I said. Okay, let's, um, again, we have chat box available for you. If you think about anything that you wanna ask the speakers, uh, go ahead and write it down. I'm going to keep the uh, program running. Hopefully, Caitlin can join us. Uh, I don't know if you if you're gonna be able to uh, have show your real face, but at least we got a pretty picture of you. Uh, <laughs> That's probably yeah. best. I'm gonna uh, not to be rude, but I'll keep my camera off to preserve my little bit of Wi-Fi. Um, Jonah, I am trying to share my screen, but I think you need to make me a, a something more than I am. Okay, let's work on that. I thought I I had done that already. Um, Jonah, okay. do you want me to put the pretest up? Yeah, let's let's do that first, and I think uh, I'll, I'll work on that for for uh, Caitlin. I'm looking, and probably you're gonna have to do the co the hosting because uh, I cannot approve Caitlin right now. I'll approve. Let me launch the poll. So okay, I'll launch the poll. If you guys can um, answer those questions, and again, this is the pre-test. So this is your knowledge before. Uh, Brittany's presentation, if you don't mind answering those, therefore we can get a um, good representation on how well this program has gone. Caitlin, I will make you a co-host, so you should be able to share. Thank you. Okie dokie. I'll give them a few minutes to finish their poll. So just let me know um, when the poll stuff is done.
All right, we'll give it 30 more seconds. All right, I am ending the poll. And you're good to go, Kaylin. Okie dokie. So um, I'm gonna try to get through this. Like I said, I'm not in my office, so my internet hopefully will be behave itself for the next 20 or 30 minutes. Um, my name is Caitlin Bainham. I'm the livestock extension agent up in Marion County. I don't deal a whole lot with our small ruminants. I do mostly horses and cattle, but we do have a small farms agent in my office that does deal with small ruminants, but um, I work a lot in forages. So, and I'm a part of the Central Florida Livestock Agents group. So my niche is gonna be talking about um, our forage topic and we're gonna focus in on cool season annual forages in just a bit. So first, I always like to start out to build the value of what our forage can do for us. And this expands across all livestock operations from beef cattle to sheep and goats. It is certainly the cheapest feed for our livestock. And here in Florida, assuming all of you are somewhere in the state of Florida, we can achieve a full year of growth raising days with some appropriate plan. Uh, it's not on everybody's radar, but we can, and we're going to talk about that. Um, good grazable pastures maintain our soil structure, which is so important, especially um, in our so-called soils, which in some parts of the state um, is tricky. And it's just a lot more aesthetically pleasing to have a green pasture than a single lot. Farm animals and their ability to produce marketable products on forage alone. Jonah, if it's getting too choppy, just let me know. It seems to be going in and out, so I'm not. Yeah, it's 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 got a uh, it's kind of catching up with you, so we're we're good. Keep keep okay. it up. And pardon for the okay. technical issues, people. Yes. Sorry, this is a new age of extension. We're working through it. So, so just to familiarize you with some terminology, some types of forage, we have our browse, which our goat folks are probably most familiar with. And this is the leaves or the tips or shrubs or trees. We have forbs, which is not necessarily our grasses. That's a category of their own. But a lot of us know this as maybe just weeds out in the pasture can be considered a forb. We have our grass, which we're probably most familiar with, our Bahia grass, for instance, and it's going to be the most productive in most scenarios, or and also the most predominant forage species in a pasture or grazing area. And then we have our legumes, which are higher quality uh, forages, and they're actually capable of fixing their own nitrogen, which we'll talk about that. Working that into a system over time can be beneficial from a soil standpoint and an animal uh, nutritional standpoint. So focusing on sheep and goats or small ruminants, what do our animals prefer? And so you can see in this chart um, from a sheep to a goat, what they prefer to graze on. Sheep, primarily grass, but goats, primarily that browse. Um, so they're really good on the fence line, up um, that shrubbery, up the trees. They're good uh, mowers in areas where other livestock might not want to graze, whereas our sheep primarily like that grassy forage. To collectively, sheep and goats are much more selective than other livestock, and they have a physical limitation due to just the sheer size of their little mouths on how much that they can consume process at a time. So it's really important that they're getting quality bites with every bite in our pasture. So we don't always think about that, but if we can fill their little mouths with quality forage, um, they're able to make more off that forage. So I'm not focusing on nutrient, and you're going to see on the next slide, it's going to be nutritional demand of goats. So both sheep and goats, for the most part, can be um, nutritionally satisfied with 
forages for the most part. Now, again, during certain times of your production, um, you know, the, that weanling stage, maybe that early lactation when we're really asking a lot of these animals, perhaps not, but depending on what you have in forages, it is possible to meet most of their nutritional demand on forages. So we're seeing here somewhere between seven to 10% crude protein and in that 50 to mid 60 um, TDN or total digestible energy is the requirement for the most of our classes of these animals Same for goats. And then we'll switch here and you can see our different forage types on that first column. And the top two is probably your pasture base, probably that first one, bahia grass. And it's anywhere from eight to 11% crude protein on a good day. And in that 50% range for total digest digestible nutrients. So even that is gonna satisfy um, some of our class of animals. And then we're gonna focus down the last three are just three examples of cool season annual forages and what they have to offer nutritionally. Um, and it's anywhere from 10 to 17% crude protein. So that's definitely going to satisfy a lot of the nutritional demand um, of our herds for the majority of the year. And then again, TDN is even higher than that of our bahia grass. So it is possible with these annual forages, if we mix them into our system, we're going to add a lot nutritionally to our herd. Some more basics, um, a lot of people might not know what I'm talking about when I say annuals or perennials. And so we're gonna kind of create some baseline knowledge. So plants have different life cycles and we have warm season plants and we have cool season plants. In Florida, our warm season dominates. And so our forages, our warm season perennials is gonna dominate as our primary forage and a perennial is basically a plant that's going to come back every year and it's not going to need to be reestablished or reseeded. It's not going to um, get to its reproductive stage and die off. It is going to simply maybe go dormant when conditions don't favor it. Um, whereas a cool season plant is simply used to close a forage gap in Florida, um, as its name suggests thrives in the cool season, which is not a primary condition of our Florida environment. So our cool season is a pretty short span of time. And so we're going to use these plants that complete their life cycle in one, one year, and they will need to be reseeded each year. So you cannot plant annuals and expect for them to come back year after year when the cool season arises. Um, if you move to different locations in the United States, you go up north, what we consider an annual might be a perennial for them when their climate shifts. If the climate shifts to favor a cool season plant and the majority of the year is cooler temperatures, cooler soil temperatures, then these cool season plants might be perennials, if that makes sense. So depending on um, the specifics of your environment and what the ambient air temperature is, what that soil temperature is for the most part, um, that's going to define what you can use as a perennial or an annual. So today we're focusing on cool season annuals because that's what we use them for here in Florida to cover some forage gaps. On that same note of building our basic knowledge, quality of forages. I hear a lot of times, especially from my horse producers that uh, we don't have good quality forage here in Florida. Or we can't grow good quality forage and, and that's not necessarily true. Um, even our perennial bahia grass can be decent quality. It's all about the inputs and the management. But generally speaking, the way that you would read this slide, it's telling you on the bottom in that orange arrow, um, the order of increasing forage quality. So basically speaking, your annuals are going to have a greater quality than your perennials. That's just a baseline fact. Your winter annuals are going to be higher quality than your summer annuals. Whoops. And your legume forages, your legumes are always going to be a higher quality than your grass forages. So it is. this is just a sliding scale to kind of show you where these various forage types fall when it comes to quality. Um, so anytime you can incorporate an annual, whether that be warm season, summer annuals this time of year, or in the fall when you're preparing for cool season forages, that is always add um, a higher nutritional kick than what your perennial bahia grass is going to give you at any given point in time. So annual might not be for everybody. We're going to talk about what evolved with them, but it is always good 
to add diversity to your forage system. So you might have what you have out there. You might not even know what it is. It's probably bahia grass, if I had to take a wild guess, um, and maybe a variety of weeds or other things that are just opportunists and existing. So anytime you can specifically plant an annual, that's gonna add diversity to your system. Um, it's gonna provide not only added forage, it's gonna give you more quantity, but as we just talked about, it's gonna improve your overall quality. Overall quality of your pastures will be improved. So when I'm talking about putting quality in each bite for these small ruminants, you're going to have a better chance at that when you're adding possibly some legumes um, or some other cool season annual grasses mixed in with what wouldn't really be there in our uh, cool season since our perennials are not going to be active. You're giving them a quality bite. So what do you, before you decide are annuals appropriate for my farm or not, determine what you need from annuals. Aside from just me telling you that they could work for you, what do you need from them? Do you need that added quality? Do you have um, production animals that time of year in our cool season, that 120 day period, um, you know, anywhere late December through April? Are you in a peak production where you could really use the added quality? That would be probably the first driver of choosing to plant annual forages. Do you just need some added quantity? Are you trying to increase your stocking rate and you need some added forage out there to simply add more animals? That's the other reason you might think about adding an annual to your forage system. And again, go back to what time of year these goals need to be met. Today, we're focusing on cool season forages, but understand that warm season annual forages are also a concept. And so if your production needs um, in quality or quantity arise during the summer, you might think about adding those warm season annual forages. So go back to the drawing board, think about what your production goals are, and then how this might work for you. Don't just jump off the deep end and decide to invest in this and then you know run the risk of it not being successful and now you've spent a lot of money. So a lot of people want to jump right to it and, and just want me to tell them what they need to plant on their place. And this is a loaded question. First of all, I always tell folks it depends on your needs, which we just find. The next biggie is your intended management. These annual forages, you cannot just invest in a little bit of seed, throw it out and, and hope for the best. You really need to be willing to provide some added inputs. That means you need to invest in fertilizer, maybe some weed control down the line. You need to be willing to be financially invested if you wanna reap the benefits of the um, quality grazing that these can offer you. And then what's your specific environment? Not just how hot does it get where you are, um, that's one thing, you know, South Florida compared to the Panhandle, we have different ambient temperatures, but also, and mostly, what's your soil type? Have you ever pulled a soil test? Are you familiar with what your pH is? Does your farm hold a lot of water? Does your farm stay really dry? These are really important questions to ask before you start considering what annual forages might work for you. So again, assess the situation of your farm, what period of time you would like to graze, How's your soil? Are you willing to be invested? And if you're not, if this isn't an area where you can put a little bit of money, then this might not be for you. Um, because while we can get these to work for you, most of the time, it's probably not going to be cheap. Um, and then most of all, what grazing management tactics will you use? And we'll cover some of those important concepts at the end. But if you're not willing to, again, put those inputs in and manage your animals, to get multiple grazing events out of these forages, then they're not gonna be economically viable for you. So again, wouldn't be for you if you just wanna use, use them one time, they're not gonna make you any money. So this is a nice chart that I borrowed that makes its way into every presentation because I like it. Um, and this just shows you over the course of the year, what is our forage potential? And right in the middle, the lower lighter green line is your bahia grass. That is your warm season perennial. So it's running anywhere from April to October with the peak being June, July, and August. That's when we probably can count on having something in our pastures. But outside of those months, um, and keep in mind, 
this is a quantity curve, but quality is also going to follow this same curve. So quality is not going to be consistent from May to October, even our behavior graphs. So thinking about your production cycle, it's likely you're going to need to supplement or find other ways to add in nutrition to your herd. And we do this with annuals. So you can see on the left-hand side, the January to May, um, that I think it's maybe a, a dark, dark green or a black line. And that blue, that dark blue line, those are all cool season forage um, potentials. And that's what we're after is to cover more of the year with quality forage, which will end up being cheaper for you in the long, long run. So now into our options. So cool season options, basically you have small grains, ryegrass, legumes, and brassicas. So your small grains is going to be oat, rye, wheat, which we don't do a whole lot of, and then triticale, which is a uh, rye wheat cross forage, rye grass, which is not the same as cereal rye. A lot of people just say, I plant winter rye, and I always ask them, do you plant rye grass or are you planting cereal rye, the small grain, because they are two very different forages. So rye grass is probably the most popular cool season option. There's a lot of varieties. Most of the varieties perform pretty well, um, at least in Central Florida where I'm at. And there's some different varieties that are specific to earlier in the season or later in the season. So again, when you're thinking about when you need to graze these forages, um, there's a, there's quite a few more options for you to choose from when it comes to ryegrass. And the overall establishment is, is a little simpler. We have our legumes, which is um, a variety of clovers, winter pea, vetch, and radish. Okay, so ryegrass, um, one can tolerate semi-wet soils. I, I don't mean it's going to do well with, you know, being underwater, but it can tolerate wet soils, which is important for some places because they just don't have a dry piece of ground if we get any rain. And again, it can provide that grazing later in the season. We're going to talk about the order in which cool season forages grow. And so if you are going to plant cool season forages, it's usually recommended to plant more than one type of cool season forage to cover more of that cool season. And ryegrass will cover that later portion of the cool season. There's a lot of varieties. There's early varieties, late varieties, and varieties that will pretty much um, grow season long. Clovers. There is a lot to know when it comes to clovers, and not all clovers are created equal. It is imperative that you find one that is suited for your soil conditions. There are some that absolutely will not tolerate what we call wet feet, meaning if your soil is going to hold water and you plant crimson clover or red clover, they're not going to do well. Same goes, there's others that, that really do perform well in the wet soil and, and maybe not as much in the dry soil. Um, these clovers are legumes. And so you do get some nitrogen fixation if, you know, systems are go. Um, and the nitrogen fixation does not mean that in that first year, you don't need to fertilize your pastures because you planted clover. It is built over time. You need to utilize these clovers in your system over a few years to build up that nitrogen fixation. Um, and again, focus on your soil type before you pick a clover. Um, and we will, I will lead due to a publication that we have each year um, that the university puts out with recommendations on actual variety types. So you can pick one that's best suited to your region as well. Species complementation. This just means planting a mixture of forages to create that longer growing grazing season. Um, so I'll skip to this last bullet point first and then come back to the second one. So the order of grow for our cool season forages is um, again, we're planting all of these things on the same day, hypothetically. In the fall, we're planting these things on the same day. Your small grains are gonna be, um, your small grains and your brassicas will come up first. And then your ryegrass, you plant oat as a small grain, choosing to plant crimson clover and maybe some radishes and um, some ryegrass all on the same day, different seeding rates, is going to really help you out because 
at a different time throughout the 120 day cool season, you're going to have something that is there ideally ready to be grazed that is going to be of decent quality. And especially for the small ruminants, I really like to complement growth type. So some of these are higher growing, taller growing species um, like our oat or our rye. And I like to complement that with a, a lower growing um, plant like some of the clovers um, or some of the brassicas. Um, it gives them, again, that variety. They're a lot more selective in their bite type. And um, putting these different mixes together um, will, will allow them to use their selectivity to continue to get those quality bites. So when to plant? Generally, and very generally, we say mid-October through the very beginning of December. And depending on who you talk to, they'll probably tell you mid-October and never past November 15th. Um, but I like to learn by doing, and I've learned by doing that it's totally dependent on moisture and much better to wait on mother nature. And if it is a dry fall and I can't plant until the first week of December because that's the first rainfall, I'm better off waiting and having my grazing pushed back a little bit than planting in the middle of a drought um, to get the seed in the ground by November 15th and then nothing does well because it's so dry. So it is very dependent on moisture. And unless you have means of irrigating your pastures or your paddocks, you're probably waiting on the rain. And so it is, it's, it's dependent year to year. Some years we have a very warm and a very dry October and first part of November. So sometimes no matter what, you're waiting until the end of November to plant. Other times we might have an early cold snap, which is good to kind of knock back some of our perennial grasses, our bahia grass, minimize some of that competition for our new cool season forages that we're planting. And we might get some adequate rainfall in October and you can plant early. So it's really hard to tell. Um, so it's kind of a waiting game and you kind of have to be a good farmer and watch the weather and, and do the best that you can. So when to graze these forages? Grazing them too soon is a good way to ruin your investment. So you want to allow them to be at least eight to 12 inches before you graze them. And this is going to be anywhere from 60 to 120 days, again, depending on what you planted. Like I said, your brassicas and your small grains are going to be in that 60 day window. They'll come up first. Your ryegrass might be a little bit later towards that, you know, 90 to 100 days point. So keep in mind what you planted and when you should expect them to be. Um, growing well to that eight to 12 inch range. Once they've reached where they're able to be grazed, you don't want to graze them too close. The grass makes more grass. So you need to leave some of that plant material in order for that cool season forage to replenish itself and create more vegetative biomass for your animals to continue to graze. And again, we want multiple grazing events. We don't want just one time you turn them into the pasture, you leave them there for three weeks and it's ruined, you ate it to the ground and it's not going to come back. You want to turn them in there for a little bit, eat it down four to five inches, you're going to take them off, it'll replenish itself and you can put them back on and you'll achieve more grazing events that will take you um, through early spring when your bahia grass is starting to come back. So how do we do this? Continuous grazing versus rotational grazing. Rotational grazing is, is definitely preferred, um, either in what we call strip grazing. So some temporary fence, you can run some animals in a strip, let them again, eight to 12 inches, you let them graze. When it's down four to five inches, you move that strip and put them on a fresh strip of that cool season forage pasture. And you just move them down the line and only give them access to a little bit at a time. Or you can do this with general bigger size paddocks if you have a big area. Just rotationally graze them from paddock one to two to three. Again, watching that forage height to move them around in order to be able to graze all of those paddocks multiple times. So there's many ways to cover your forage gaps outside of our spring to early fall, which is our, our forage base, our bahia grass base. And there's many ways that you can add that quality. You can add those forage types that your sheep and your goat are going to be after. Um, but you have to be the one to decide how much input and management you're willing to put forth 
And it's totally okay if you say, oh, I, I don't want to have it at all. And I really don't want to spend any money on cool season forages, or I don't have any equipment to do this. Just be honest with yourself and be honest with us and, and we'll find a, a different route for you. Um, but we don't want to get you invested in something that's going to disappoint you if you haven't done some of the prerequisites. So consider planting annuals if you're willing to be involved in your forage management, which I'm sure most of you are. Um, and nothing is going to make up for a lack of grazing management. You can plant all of the best looking annuals in the state of Florida. You can graze them, um, you know, as much as you want, but if you ruin them, again, it's going to be a waste of investment. And the same goes for your general pasture management. Nothing makes up for lack of grazing management. There's not enough herbicide in the world. There's not enough fertilizer in the world to make up for where you fall short with your grazing management. So always focus on that first. Maybe the first thing you should do is just implement a rotational grazing system before you think about adding annuals, um, just a general good practice. And then when you do add annuals or you, you attempt to add annuals your first year, it'll be a lot easier to manage already. So that is all I have. Hopefully I got through that in time and with minimal internet failure. And again, I'm here for questions. Um, put them in the chat. You can ask yourself. If you jinxed it. Or you can shoot me an email. We got the captions. Stop working. Yeah. We got the captions going, so that helps a lot. Oh, well, okay. Hopefully I knew what I was saying. We don't know, but that's okay. Uh, it was not that bad. Uh, Luis has uh, his hand raised. Uh, he's got a question. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, I just have a question. Um, normally, the pH requirements for most forage are almost similar. Are the pH requirements for those annuals are mostly similar for those perineers too? Question. Generally speaking, when we're talking about clover, like legumes and, and some of our other cool season forages, pH requirements are a little bit higher than what we would recommend for um, bahia grass, you know, probably six, upwards of six, six and a half. Um, so if your pH is, you know, five, five and a half, which might work perfect for bahia grass, it might be a little too acidic for some of our annuals. So it really depends what you're, what you're after in cool season annuals. You might be okay, but over time, it, it might be an issue. Okay, thank you. That You're welcome. Good. Anybody else has any uh, questions, comments for Caitlin? Uh, there's a lot of information. Uh, we have her presentation uploaded on our share drive, and we're going to share that with you uh, shortly after uh, all the sessions are done, or hopefully before then. We're working on those details as well. Any other questions for Caitlin, please uh, don't be shy. And if you don't have any, that's cool. And if you think about any questions, uh, you can also uh, write them on, on the chat box and uh, she'll get to them uh, later as well. All right. Let's move on to the next topic in our list, uh, which is going to be gastrointestinal parasite management. Our, this is one of the favorite topics of all time. Uh, with us, we got Dr. Deal, and she's going to educate us on what we can do because we are in Florida. Yes. <laughs> there's not much. Uh, that we can escape from, but uh, there's some some management strategies that, that can help us. All right. Can you all see my screen okay and hear me all right? Yes. All right. So we'll get started. Yes, as Jenna said, um, this is a hot topic kind of everywhere across the country, but especially here in the southeast where we have, seem to have a parasite problem year-round due to um, just temperature, the hot human temperatures. Um, these parasites love to thrive in that environment. So real quick, just an introduction. I'm a veterinarian at the University of Florida College of Vet Med. Um, I work in the farms department and I'm a second year resident here uh, at UF. So we're just gonna kind of do a brief overview because this topic is fairly complex, which I'm sure you guys have 
some of what I'll be telling you today will be a repeat, but hopefully uh, some of it will be new information that you guys can implement um, in your herds or flocks. So we'll just briefly cover the parasite that there's lots of parasites out there, but the main one that most people are concerned about is homonchus, and that's what we're going to focus on today. Um, we're going to talk about anthelmintics and resistance um, to those anthelmintics that exist and has have been becoming even more troublesome as time has progressed. Um, and then try to focus on a multi-tool approach to um, overcome these parasite issues and to help control them within your flocks and herds. So the main worm that we're concerned about is Homunculus contortus. It's also known as the barber pole worm. So it gets this name for the appearance that it has here. You can see it's coiling of its digestive tract in there that's red and it has kind of a white appearance. So it kind of reminds people of the barber pole if you're at um, the barber shop, the spinning thing on the outside. That's what that's why I got that nickname. So this is a nematode parasite and it's very pathogenic to um, any species that it infects, but we're primarily concerned about small ruminants with this parasite. It has a, it's very um, highly fecund, so it has a very high rate of fertility. These things can reproduce, and um, if you have perfect conditions like we have outside right now, it's very humid, it's um, the middle of June, um, these things can have a turnaround time from eggs to being adult, mature larvae. Um, back to larvae in a matter of just 14 days, which is really, really fast um, compared to a lot of the other parasites that will take at least 21 days or longer to reproduce. And the other um, primary concern with this parasite is they consume a pretty large volume of the host's blood. So they can consume up to 0 0.05 mLs of blood per day, which will not take long for um, a a uh, lamb or a kid, especially that's a lot smaller, that has a smaller blood volume to become uh, very anemic and potentially uh, die due to this parasitism. So the clinical manifestations that this parasite causes is usually pretty generic, which I'm sure a lot of you guys are probably already familiar with. So sometimes, unfortunately, all you'll see is um, that your animal will suddenly die and you won't know what's happened. But sometimes, most of the time, there are leading signs up to it. You just have to know what to look for and hopefully be able to catch it um, prior to it even leading to this. But in general, our goal would be to prevent this um, prior to any of these signs even being displayed. But typically, the way that we fall down the tree here is you'll continue to see, you'll start to see some weight loss and lethargy in these animals as they become um, anemic. Diarrhea or constipation can be seen. However, diarrhea is not overly common with homunculus um, compared to um, some of our other gastrointestinal parasites, especially like coccidia, for example, and young, young stock, you'll see more, more diarrhea signs. But homunculus can uh, cause diarrhea, but it's much less common. Um, anemia is our primary sign that you're going to see, which we will, a lot of times, um, clients or producers will use the Formata system. Um, veterinarians use that as well uh, to kind of gauge um, a subjective score on our anemic status of our, our stock prior to having to run further diagnostics to actually check blood volume levels as well as fecal egg counts. And then um, usually the last thing when um, things start to get really severe before the animal will succumb to this disease is they'll get some submandibular edema, which is also called bottle jaw, which is a result of hypoproteinemia um, state within the, the body. And that's due to the uh, parasite just, just ravaging the body's whole supply of protein and blood from it. So quickly, um, just to review the FAMACHA system in case if um, there's somebody here that's not familiar with how the system works. So the FAMACHA system was developed many years ago and it works pretty well. It has a very decent correlation with the pack cell volume or the whole or the blood volume of the small ruminant. So we're, this is a one to five scale, as you can see here on this card. A one is gonna be bright red um, and that's, that's the best you can be. Um, and then number five is going to take us clear down to um, the white, and that's going to be pale. So what we're going to compare this, this um, color chart to here 
is going to be this um, subconjunctiva of the eye. So this is something that typically when I'm checking sheep, you, I only usually check one eye, but if you're concerned about, um, you know, you're kind of between like, oh, is she a two or three or a three or four, you can double check with that other eye um, to see if it sways you in one direction or the other. But typically um, I'm gonna press down at the top of the eyelid and I'm gonna roll roll out with the bottom one and make sure you're looking at that subconjunctive eye and don't get too far forward and look at the third eyelid or you may uh, have a value that's skewed um, one way or the other. A lot of times that third eyelid tends to be more white. So if you look at it um, and don't actually look back here, you may end up scoring your animal higher than what it um, really is. So as a kind of a rule of thumb of what a lot of producers do is use a one and a two as um, no deworming needed. Um, everybody's good to go. And then if you have a three, it's a questionable of maybe I should deworm, but maybe I should also take into consideration whether there's some other clinical signs of illness going on. And then if there's a four or five, um, they're recommending deworming. So that's a, that's a good rule of thumb to use. However, if you have um, some other tools available to you, I would encourage you to also use um, like a fecal egg, a McMaster's fecal egg count to use in addition to just using Camacho scoring, because that's really going to tell you um, if the animal does have a really heavy parasite burden or maybe their conjunctiva just doesn't fill as much and it's a little bit more pale, but they may not actually have a high fecal egg count. So that will um, avoid you have using anthelmintics there and will hopefully help to avoid um, the um, resistance from occurring. So let's just talk briefly and kind of define uh, anthelmintic resistance. So I'm sure you all are pretty familiar with this, um, but anthelmintic resistance is defined as a substantial increase in a specific nematode population which is able to tolerate lethal drug doses for the majority of individual nematodes that are of the same species. And unfortunately, um, within the last really probably 10 years or so, there's been a substantial amount of anthelmintic resistance seen worldwide, not just um, in certain parts of the country or certain parts of the world, but uh, all over the place to basically all the commercial anthelmintics that we have available. And this is occurring in the small ruminant industry as well as um, in other species. Um, this goes for not homunculus, but we have anthelmintic resistance in cattle, dogs, cats, the list just goes on and on. <clears throat> so as a result of this, it's unfortunate that um, it's occurred, but as a result, we need to find another way to try to mitigate the situation because the the rate at which new drugs are being developed is very, very slow. And if we don't find another way to deal with this problem, there will not no longer be any small ruminants um, left on the planet. So we need to find another way to mitigate this. So in order to do that, I like to recommend using a multi-tool approach. There's no one size fits all here. And one thing that you can do to fix all of it, you're gonna have to use multiple different things to try to mitigate this. So rotational grazing, which kind of also goes along um, with what the previous speaker was talking about. So there's multiple reasons for doing this for forage quality, as well as it has uh, its place in uh, parasite control as well. You want to use targeted selective deworming. And then we're also going to try to implement the use of resistant animals for breeding. And we'll do this through phenotypic selection. Um, it, in estimated breeding values, which is EBVs, and genomic enhanced estimated breeding values, which is GEBVS. And I'll go into each of these here a little bit further in the next slides. So rotational grazing is using more than one pasture during the grazing season. Resting periods provide time for the plant to regrow as well as death of the parasitic larva. So as a kind of a good rule of thumb, and again, there's a lot of factors that are going to play into whether this holds exactly true for your farm. It's going to depend on what type of forages you have available, um, how big your pasture is, and all sorts of things. But in general, a rule of thumb is going to be that you, want, you should be able to sustain 10 ewes and about 15 lambs per acre of pasture. Um, so in order to 
effectively rotate pastures is going to also depend on your forage quality and quantity. But for the purposes of parasite control, um, not including um, all the other things that were spoke about in the last uh, presenter's PowerPoint, um, we really recommend about a 30 day interval for rotation uh, for grazing for parasite control only. So this means allow, uh, if you allow your animals to graze on a pasture for 30 days, then you want to remove them from that pasture and allow that pasture to rest somewhere between 30 to 100 days. So 30 days meaning a minimum of rest, but if you can get 100 days, that would be even better um, prior to allowing repeat grazing of that pasture again. So targeted selective deworming. So something that a lot of people talk about is the 80-20 rule, which is called the, which is referring to 80% of the gastrointestinal nematode eggs that are shed onto your pasture typically come from about 20% of the animals in your flock. So that's important to remember because a lot of folks like to go through and just deworm everybody that's a part of their um, herd or flock and it that's that's another reason why that's not an ideal situation here is because a lot the majority of the animals in your your herd or flock are not the ones shedding the uh, eggs you have a select few that are shedding the majority of the eggs and then the majority of the other ones are just hanging somewhere in the middle to the lower levels so our goal to um with targeted selective deworming is to maintain refugia so refugia is the goal of leaving some nematodes or some homunculus unexposed to dewormers. That's just another way of saying we're giving them a refuge to, re to result in the reduced development of drug resistance. So we're allowing a group of parasites to not be exposed to the dewormer. We're doing that intentionally in hopes that we will they will continue to remain susceptible to those dewormers. So if they need, if they do reach an elevated threshold that they do need to be dewormed because they're becoming anemic, then they will be sensitive to that dewormer and it will effectively be able to kill those parasites that they have. <clears throat> so in order to do this, we need to effectively identify the animals within the flock or herd that are infected and treat those animals specifically instead of treating the entire group. So in order to do this, I really recommend establishing a routine um, for checking your animals, whether it's just doing Sumatra scoring, whether you're doing a combination, it's really better to do a combination of something like Sumatra scoring, body condition scoring, as well as if you're able to implement fecal egg count on a regular basis, whether you get training to be able to do that or whether you're work closely with your veterinarian to get a group of those run on a regular basis. However you'd like to do it, I really recommend using a multifaceted approach. And one way that we'll go through here on the next slide is the five point check. But our goal with these things is to only treat heavily parasite burden individuals. So do not blanket deworm everyone. We also do not recommend rotating dewormers as this was a previously recommended practice um, for a long time. Um, but now we know that if we're regularly rotating dewormers, we're regularly subjecting those animals and those parasites that those animals have to all the classes of dewormers that are available. And this will cause resistance to these dewormers to develop at an even faster rate. And then ultimately, if you have animals within your herd that are repeat offenders, they repeatedly have really poor Fumatra scores or repeatedly have really high fecal egg counts, it would be very advantageous for you to call those animals from your herd because you don't want to perpetuate those genetics from your herd. And you also don't want them to be continuing to just dump those parasites that are resistant onto your pasture for the other animals in your herd to pick up. So the five-point check um, used to evaluate deworming needs of the flock is listed here. So there's basically the five items that you want to look at, and these don't just cover um, homunculus. These cover most of the parasites that are out there and able to infect um, small ruminants. That would include the eye, the back, the rear, the jaw, and the nose. 
So the I is with the Fumatra score, which we discussed already. So we're indicating paleness with that. And the barbopole pole worm, which is Homunculus contortus, is the main one that we're assessing. However, the liver fluke and coccidia can also cause um, anemia. With the back, they're referring to body condition score here. So all of our parasites that can affect um, sheep or goats are going to typically have some type of effect on body condition score and cause the animal to, to drop some weight. Rear, we're talking about fecal soiling um, on the back of the tail. So we have the brown stomach worm, the hair worm, the thread worm, nodule worm, and coccidia that typically cause um, diarrhea. Notice that the barber pole worm is not listed here typically. With the jaw, we're talking about bottle jaw. So this is that hypoproteinemia that we talked about earlier. And the barber pole worm is the main one that is going to cause this. Um, however, the liver fluke can also. And then the nose, um, probably less commonly an issue, but we still see it. Um, nasal discharge can be an indicator, but there can also be other issues if you have um, an animal with nasal discharge. But um, that can be an indicator of nasal bots being present. So um, we're just going to talk about bioworma here for a few minutes. This is a topic that um, I was asked to um, bring up today, and um, it had got, you know, a, a decent amount of um, noise among the, the industry and across the country um, here in the U.S., as well as worldwide. Everybody was really excited about it when it first came out, and I think we're still excited about its potential um, for use. However, we have um, some work to do, I think, to get it to where we want it. So as far as its approval in the United States, it became available for purchase in 2019. So about um, two years ago. This um, product, if you're not familiar with it, is not an anthelmintic or a dewormer, but it uh, contains a natural fungus, um, which I have listed here, but I'm not gonna attempt to pronounce it for y'all today. So you can use your imagination. <laughs> Um, so the spores remain inert and um, when, the, when the sheep or goat consume this and there's no effect on the host animal by the biowormer and it resists digestion when they consume it. So it passes through the stomach, uh, through the GI tract, into feces and then eventually on the pasture. And when it's on the pasture is when its activity really actually starts to move forward. So they... Um, the goal of this fungi is to interrupt the reproduction of the infective larva parasites and reduce um, parasite reinfection of the larva that are passed in the feces. The label on this product still recommends the utilization of chemical dewormers, so it does not eliminate your use for anthelmintics. You still need to um, deworm your, your sheep and goats as needed. Um, the point of this product is to really mitigate the amount of um, larvae that are perpetuating on the pasture that can then be spread to the other animals as they continue to graze that pasture. That's the point of it. But our biggest challenge with this product at this point, um, especially here in the US, is the cost. Um, it's a substantial, Premier One is about, is the primary place where you could uh, purchase this product if you wanted to. Um, at this point in time, however, from Premier One's pricing, they're running $345 for a 10 pound pail of this stuff, which is not going to get you very far considering they're going to need to eat a couple ounces of this um, on a weekly basis. So this is um, rather expensive. I think the potential for this is still really great um, for the future, but we're going to have to work um, on some avenues to try to get that price down to make it more reasonable for producers uh, to use in the future. So utilization of resistant animals for breeding is what we're gonna kind of focus in on here uh, as we move through the rest of the talk. So this is really advantageous as it's gonna help um, you to produce resistant genetics within your flock. So this is going to be useful for you as well as anybody else that you may um, you know, sell seed stock to if you're into that. Um, it will minimize pasture parasite burden and contamination, uh, which is going to help the health of your entire flock and herd. And it has 
economic benefits for you. So this is going to result in reduced losses due to treatment and death of these animals and also turn into increased profitability due to enhanced health and growth of all your animals as well. So phenotypic selection is something that is primarily relied upon um, by most producers in order to determine who to retain in the flock, um, whether you're doing this for, you know, carcass weight or all sorts of things, weaning weight, you know, the list goes on and on. But when we talk about um, parasite selection, typically there's a handful of parameters that we're going to use to kind of make our decision on whether somebody's retained in the herd or not. So everybody, we can pretty much consider either susceptible or resistant individuals within the herd. You may have a few that are uh, potentially resilient as well, but not necessarily resistant. I'm going to spend a lot of time going into that today. But um, ways that we can measure these parameters primarily are going to be FAMACHA score, body condition score, fecal egg count, and PCV which is something that you'll probably have to have your uh, veterinarian do unless you um, are a technician or something and have some of the capabilities to do this on your own. So using this information that we get from phenotypic data from our animals, um, we can translate that into something called estimated breeding values. So this is, um, it's been out for a few years now, but this is still kind of a relatively new idea, I guess, in the small ruminant world. And um, if you have cattle, you're going to be much more familiar with um, this. This is very similar to EPDs and cattle. Um, so basically, I'm just going to give you some definitions here, and then we'll talk about it a little bit more. And I know I have a lot of stuff about um, with sheep pictures on here, and that's because that's primarily what I work with. But this, there are EBV values as well for goats. Um, so this stuff translates right over for goats as well, if you're a goat producer and not producing sheep. So again, um, we were saying phenotype is a measurable set of individual characteristics. So this, for example, there's a lot of these. Um, besides parasites, we, we consider phenotype can include the number of lambs that are born, a birth weight, and a weaning weight, num number of lambs weaned, mature weight, loin muscle depth. These are measurable values that we can get for all of um, your animals within your flock. And then a phenotype results from the animal's genetics and the environment that it's raised. And that's what we get that phenotype from. So when we select breeding animals, producers select genetics they wish to pass on based on these phenotypic traits. And again, this list can extend on out. These can go for parasites as well and many, many other things. The problem is we cannot differentiate what is caused by genetics versus the environment just by looking at the phenotype. So this is where EBV values come in. So EBVs began to be um, established by the NSIP, which is the National Sheep Improvement Program. Again, this is um, also still going to be utilized, though, in uh, um, the goat for goat producers as well. So EBVs are used to quantify the genetic merit of a breeding sheep or goat. Um, this is calculated by accounting for these known sources of variation for each phenotype trait. And they use adjustment factors to eliminate sources of environmental variation because there's a lot of things that are going to be influenced by the environment. Um, if you're in North Florida or South Florida, if you're you know somewhere else, in a complete different part of the country, for someone to be able to compare whether you know one Katahdin sheep here in Florida is similar to a Katahdin sheep out in you know California or somewhere in the Northeast. Um, so we have to be able to kind of try to account for these environmental variations to be able to really effectively compare um, and quantify these, these values um, for these animals. And again, certain traits are influenced more by genetics than environment and vice versa. And this genetic variation is called heritability. So how do, how do getting these EBV values work? How do you go about getting them for your animals? Well, the NSIP takes care of calculating these values for you, um, so and as well as for the other people. So they created a large database 
that you can look at to be able to compare the genetic merit of your stock versus someone else's. And if you're buying an animal, you know, you can compare these values for them as well. Um, and again, this, this is, works for parasite resistance. It works for um, weaning weights, birth weights, you know, um, whether uh, you is known to be producing twins or singles, like there's a lot of different um, really useful things that, that um, the NSIP has done with these EBVs. So it's, it's really exciting that the small ruminant producers are able to use this. This is something that cattle producers have kind of had for a really long time and we're getting kind of catching up here, but it's exciting that we're able to join in on this. So if you're interested in doing something like this, um, you do need to be um, pretty much running purebred stock or seed stock to be able to, to do it as of right now in order for um, them to really be able to quantify as accurately as possible these values. But if you would like to join them, you can become a member. And what you'll do is take some samples from your contemporary groups and provide them with um, these values that they ask you for and they'll give you the specific parameters that they that they would that they would need so there'll be certain um, ages and fecal egg counts you would provide the weights at birth and weaning and those types of things and you they need typically about uh, lambs or kids from at least two sires and about 15 lambs or kids from each sire to be able to really get a good representative group to be able to create these um, comparative groups and then they'll be able to um, give you values that you can use for your own stock as well as other folks. And then taking those EBVs is another step forward. Um, there, the NSIP is uh, this year beginning in 21, um, they're adding in the genomic enhanced uh, portion of the EBVs to make GEBVS which is here at the beginning only going to be um, useful for the Katahdin group because they have to connect, collect genomic data. So they'll uh, collect blood samples from producers and then they'll be, they will um, run genomic analysis on these DNA samples and they will be utilized to more accurately predict genetic merit of these animals. So, the benefit of GBVs over the EBV provides improvement of the accuracy. So breeding values or EBVs are simply estimates of the genetic potential. So our accuracy of those depends on how close the EBV is to the true breeding value for that given trait that you're measuring, whether that be parasite resistance, carcass weight, um, loin depth, etc. GBVs suggests accuracy improvements of 2 to 24%, depending on the trait. So they're going to bump the accuracy of this EBV from anywhere from 2 to 24%. So you'll be, you'll be able to rely on that value of being accurate from somewhere up to close to 25% greater than what you would be if you're just using the EBV value alone. Um, and this technology is going to combine uh, genomic information, the individual pedigree, which is going to look at the familial tree, and progeny data. And if you want more information about this, I really encourage you to contact the NSIP and look into this, as this will be really uh, useful for uh, you and other producers that you may sell seed stock to. So our take-home message really has three points um, for parasite management. One, one size does not fit all. You have to use a multi-tool approach, whether that, and that should really include um, grazing management and rotation. That's going to include targeted selective deworming. You need to get yourself on some type of schedule to be doing a FAMACHA score and fecal egg counting these animals and really be able to narrow down who's resistant, who's super susceptible in your herd, and to be able to make that. Um, worthwhile to, to really narrow that down to minimize your pasture infectivity as well. You need to implement uh, routine parasite mitigation strategies for success. And then if you're a purebred or seed stock producer, I really encourage you to consider joining the NSIP. And this will provide an opportunity to identify genetics to accelerate the genetic performance of your flock and the entire breed 
across the board uh, nationwide as well as globally. And with that, I'll take any questions. My email is also there. Um, if you guys uh, want to shoot me an email afterwards or uh, think of something later, I'm happy to try to field those questions for you. Any questions for Dr. Deal? A lot of information and a lot of good information, by the way. It's uh, great to have an update on parasite strategies and management strategies, I guess. Uh, yeah, you've been hearing the same thing for years on how to use for matcha and stuff like that. So it's, it's really good. Yeah, in a way, some of the stuff's still the same as it's always been. And in a way, it is still, it's evolving. So, mm -hmm. but. yeah, love that UF has a dedicated team of small ruminant production specialists and uh, veterinarians such as yourself. I see Catalina's yeah. name there. and She's going to be there with us tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our small ruminant team here has definitely been growing. It's very encouraging for us and for the producers. So we're excited about it. Any questions for our speaker before we let her go and we go on with our final remarks? Unmute your mic and fire away. I have... I have a question about the um, uh, the fecal test. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, if you were to do it on your own, do you recommend a microscope and some? And where would you find like the uh, diagrams of the parasite you're looking for? Yeah. So if you're something you're gonna do yourself, which is absolutely something you can do, I definitely would recommend you getting together like with your veterinarian. Um, just to kind of get some training initially, but it's something they can they can train you to do for sure. Um, you would need a microscope, absolutely. Um, the McMaster slides, um, they're actually fairly expensive. Um, just a single McMaster slide is going to run you about $20. Um, but if you've got a large group of sheep, honestly, it will pay for itself pretty easily. Um, and then the solution that you make, um, we use this, you can use a sugar and water solution. We use a salt and water solution. It just, it, um, depends on what your vet may recommend, but either will work just fine. Um, and if you get together with your vet, they can train you how to, um, to, to, cert to prepare the slides. Cause there is a certain process that you have to go through to make sure you're able to quantify the, the egg number accurately and identify the eggs accurately. And then after that point, you'll be golden. If you do a couple of them in a row, I'm sure you'll probably get pretty quick at it. But um, yeah, it's something you can definitely do, but I would recommend um, not just YouTubing it and trying it for the first time. <laughs> like get, get a little training um, and then you can absolutely do it yourself. I would encourage you to put that on our evaluation so you can have, so, so we can design a demonstration for next year's more Yeah, more. absolutely. Okay, yeah, we were... We were talking also with the producer recently um, about trying to maybe get a workshop in the future um, for something like that. But if you all would find that useful, please let us know. Yeah, I, I just thought it would be helpful because um, I don't, our vet, um, they, they take the samples and I don't think they read them themselves. So you're a couple of days out um, getting them back. So I just, thought it would be easier for us if we just have a really small flock but it would be easier um to be able to read them ourselves and sure and yeah there them. are some there are some veterinarians that do send their fecal samples out so i really i can't speak for um what your vet does but that is possible that they may be sending them out as well and not doing them themselves but all righty any other questions Okay, let's go to the green back end of this thing. I uh, just want to remind you guys about next uh, uh, session, which is going to be tomorrow, same time, same channel. Use the same link as the one that you have uh, for today's talk. Tomorrow we're going to have Laura Bennett. She's a livestock agent for Pasco, Sundrum, and Herman Hernando County uh counties uh talking about uh reproduction selection so it goes 
uh, really good uh, in hand with uh, Dr. Uh, Deal's topic uh, of, of uh, EPDs and stuff like that. Breeding so uh, season preparedness with Dr. Cabrera. Uh, it's gonna be next. Those are gonna be our uh, only two topics for uh, tomorrow's session. And then the uh, day after tomorrow, uh, we're gonna finish off with kidding and lambing management by Dr. Cabrera. And then Dr. Vias with the nutrition uh, for breeding herds. Also, um, if you found this uh, session useful and uh, wanna go ahead and fill our evaluation, uh, you can you can do that uh, by just typing our link uh, or using your cell phone and snapping it, a picture of the QR code if you're watching us from your TV or you're watching us from your computer and you have your cell phone handy, you can do this as well. I'm going to paste our evaluation uh, uh, link in uh, in the chat box as well so you can access it through there. Um, um again i'm going to stop sharing this thing and uh, hopefully we can see you tomorrow there's some people missing that register so if your friend did not make it today for some reason uh we're gonna have these sessions reported and uh, and logged in in facebook and uh also we're recording them and we're hopefully gonna put them on youtube for future references for you we're compiling all the information from our speakers into one big file. So that's going to be up your way as well. Anyway, I'm going to leave you guys today and end the session and hope to see you tomorrow.